Lord, Father God, help us every day to, to continue to surrender our lives to you. You are a mighty, awesome king, Lord. You can, you know our struggles. You know our prayers. Before we even verbalize that. Father God, teach us each day, each day, to surrender our lives to you. Father, I just ask that you would fill Pastor Zach with your Holy Spirit to bring his words to us. And may we take the challenge to change. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys actually may be seated. And if you would, please grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ruth. I definitely want you looking at the text because it's a long text. And so open to the book of Ruth. So if you hit Judges, you haven't gone far enough. If you get into the Samuels, you've gone too far. And in setting this up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read for us all of chapter 1, which is why I allowed you guys to sit down. So hear the word of the Lord. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law and returned to the country of Moab, or from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I have sons in my womb that, you may, that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi 
when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. That is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and God, we thank you for all of it. Not just Paul's letters, not just the Gospels and the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. Father, we thank you for the history of your dealings with your people that you have preserved for us in writing. We thank you, God, for the marvelous stories of your past faithfulness that encourage us to hope for and expect your future faithfulness. As we come now to this little book, God, called Ruth, I ask, Father, that you would open our eyes to behold your glory through it. As always, God, I ask that you would be with me as I preach, that you would protect me from error, that you would enable me to preach this morning with accuracy, clarity, and with the power of your Spirit. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Ruth, a book that's often overlooked due to its size, a book that's often kept behind the closed doors of women's Bible studies, a book that is oftentimes neglected in the large gathering of the church. The book of Ruth is a book that is underestimated by many, being thought of primarily as a love story between two people, Ruth and Boaz. But as people think that, they actually miss the main point of the book. You see, Ruth is a short yet powerful story that that shows us our God and how He normally works in the affairs of our lives. Now, over the next handful of weeks, we're going to be diving into this short little book together. And I hope that you're going to begin to see it not primarily as a love story between Ruth and Boaz, although that is in it, I hope that you primarily see it as a testimony to the faithfulness of God to His promises and to His people. You know, the entire book of Ruth is summarized perfectly in Sinclair Ferguson's title to his book on Ruth, and that is Faithful God. That's what the book of Ruth is all about. It is all about our faithful God. Now, this week, my goal is just to give us a a basic introduction to the book, give you somewhat of a brief overview. And so with this in mind, this week is probably going to be heavier on the information side, but I hope that you will get excited about the short little book that we're going to be studying together and that it will spur you on to study it on your own at home during the week before you hear it preached on a Sunday morning. Now, as we go about this overview of Ruth this morning, I have a question that I want you to chew on, put in your pocket, keep with you. Here's my question. Do you trust our God? Do you trust our God? You know, the book of Ruth is one of my favorite books in the Bible because it shows us without a doubt that we can trust our God, even in the most difficult circumstances that we face. Now, Before we go any further, I do want to press us into uh, why it's important for us to study a book like Ruth. Like, obviously, all of what we said should make us want to study this book already, but why else is is it beneficial for us to spend a handful of weeks going through a small, often overlooked book like Ruth? Well, many of us whether knowingly or not, most of the time not, we kind of form our own canon in Scripture, okay? And it usually happens right here at the last two-thirds of our Bible. So we spend a lot of time going through the Gospels, we spend a lot of time in the epistles, but we don't spend a lot of time elsewhere because we think, after all, as the Church of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, the Gospels, the epistles, they're the most pertinent for us as believers, But here's what we miss if we come to that conclusion. Paul said, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Catch that. All Scripture, right? All of it. Let me say it one more time. All of it. Old Testament and New. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, abundantly equipped for every good work. Now, it should go without saying 
that Paul, when he wrote that to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he had primarily in mind the Old Testament because the New Testament was not canonized yet. Similar to when Jesus said this in the Gospels, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have life, but it is they that testify about me. He's exclusively speaking to the Old Testament there. He gave the greatest lesson on the Old Testament ever with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We don't have the contents of that. I wish we did. But what did he do there? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets. That is shorthand for the entire Old Testament. Beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures things concerning himself. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, speaking of the Old Testament saints, he said this, But these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And so why preach uh, a little overlooked and underestimated book like the book of Ruth from the Old Testament? Here's my answer. Because if we focus Solely on the New Testament, we will be an extremely malnourished group of believers. Secondly, we're going to the book of Ruth, followed by actually a series in the Psalms this summer, and then jumping into the Gospel of John starting in the fall, because I want us to see the beauty of God's Word by spending time in the different aspects of God's Word. You know, Scripture does not read like one long newspaper article detailing God's dealings with humanity in the past, the future, and in the present. Like, God would be worthy of being praised for that, right? Because He did not have to reveal Himself at all to us. But He has chosen to reveal Himself. And He has done so in multiple different literary ways. The Bible is a literary masterpiece. And not just because the Bible is all about one story of God's glory through His Son, written over a long period of time through some 40 different human authors, it is a literary masterpiece because that one story of redemption is told through a whole lot of literary genres. The Bible is like a diamond you hold up to the light. You turn it and you see the beauty of different angles. In the Bible, there's historical narrative, there's law, poetry, wisdom literature, apocalyptic literature, gospels, which are a genre by themselves, also the epistles or the letters. And even within those macro genres, there are subgenres that are beautiful in and of themselves. For instance, in the gospels, you have the parables. In the Psalms, you have wisdom psalms, imprecatory psalms, uh, psalms of lament, psalms of praise, psalms of thanksgiving. Psalms of enthronement, messianic psalms. And so, all of Scripture is beautiful, and it should be admired for the masterpiece that it is. It reveals to us some of the beauty of God and how He chose to reveal Himself to us. And what you'll notice over the years as I preach here, that I, I do like to alternate between New Testament and Old Testament, and I also like to mix up the genres. Why do I like to do that? So that no matter where you find yourself in the Bible, you can mine the gold that is under the surface for yourself, no matter where you're at. And so, let me ask this question now. Is it worth our time to go through a book like Ruth? You better believe it is. And so, as I've already said this morning, we're going to have more of an overview, a brief overview of the book of the whole. And with that in mind, here are three headings that I'd like to cover this morning together as we get into the text. Number one, I want to set up the setting. Number two, I want to talk about the main characters in the text. And then number three, I want to talk about two main themes. So set up the setting, talk about the characters, and then two main themes. Let me say this. There is a whole lot that I should include in an overview sermon on Ruth that I could not possibly fit in here, okay? So there is a lot that is going to be left for us to uncover later. This is just what I want us to know heading into it so we can have our eyes on the lookout for what God is up to in the book of Ruth. And so let's go to the setting. In our English Bibles, the book of Ruth is situated chronologically between Judges and 1 Samuel. 
and we see that from the time marker in verse 1. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, and so this place is Ruth, it happening somewhere between 1380 and 1050 B.C. Now, this time marker in verse 1 is important for giving us the backdrop of what's happening in the time of Naomi and her family's lives. The book of Judges, as we know, is a continual downward spiral of the nation of Israel, right? So, God had... had entered into a covenant with them. And in that covenant, there was blessings and there was curses. So if they remained faithful to the covenant, God would bless them. However, if they abandoned him and proved unfaithful, they would land under the curses of God. And what we see throughout the book of Judges is that Israel would fail to be faithful. And in response to that, God would bring about judgment on the land through an enemy nation. Then the Israelites would cry out for God, help, help, save We're repenting, and God would hear the cries of his people. And what would he do? He would raise up a judge from among them, and that judge would deliver them from the oppression of the enemy nations. Now, this happens in cyclical fashion throughout the book of Judges. And as we progress through that narrative, here's what we see. It gets worse and worse. The people's hearts grow harder and harder against God to where at the end of the book, It ends with this ominous note. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, that's the the situation that Naomi and her family were in. And we read here at the beginning of the text that they were in Bethlehem, which ironically means house of bread. Guess what? Because of the unfaithfulness of God's people in the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land and there was no bread to be found in Bethlehem. And so there was a decision to make for Naomi and her family. Would they stay in the promised land that God had provided for them and trust that God would provide for them as he promised to do, or would they take matters into their own hands and seek provision and refuge apart from God elsewhere. And Naomi and her family chose the latter option. Elimelech, whose name means my God is my king, chose to leave the land of his king in order to find refuge apart from him. Basically, Elimelech was like, listen, we got to make a decision. We got to do something. There's nothing here. It's famine. Let's take matters into our own hands. Go to a different country. Let's go to Moab. And so we read in verse 1, follow along there once again. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn, that's an important word, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years and both Mahlon and Kilion died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. And so, this is the opening scene to the great drama that is Ruth. The story of Ruth starts with famine in the land, and Naomi and her family leave the land that God would promised would flow with milk and honey to find refuge apart from God and apart from His promises. Now, once again, Bethlehem is a part of the promised land, right? It is the house of bread. It is the place in Micah that's known as the, the redemptive hope of Israel. And so it's no small thing that Elimelech took his family outside of that and specifically took them to Moab. You catch that? Took him to Moab. Moab was one of the oppressing nations in the book of Judges. It was a pagan country. They worshiped the gods of nature. It was filled with prostitution, especially in their worship. And every indication here at the beginning of the text, especially in verse 1, suggests that Naomi and her family, once again, were there to sojourn. So the suggestion is, They went there for a little bit of time, to take shelter for a little bit of time. But so often what happens when we we go 
a different way than God told us to go, we end up staying there way too long. Look at verse 4. So they went to sojourn for a short time, but verse 4 tells us that they lived there about 10 years. Notice that language. They lived there for about 10 years. Now, what was the result? Did they find the provision, the refuge, the rest that they so desperately wanted when they left? No. Elimelech died, followed by Naomi's two sons, to where she was left utterly alone with her daughters-in-law and in a male-dominated society where the guy provided. She was without hope. And this is what we can rightly call bitter providence. Have you ever heard that phrase? This is bitter providence of God in Naomi's life. Naomi knew that God was ultimately in control of all the circumstances of her life, and she knew that he had dealt bitterly with her. And so she returns to Bethlehem at the end of chapter 1, and everybody's like, can this really be Naomi? Like, I can't really tell. She's been through the ringer, obviously, if it is her. And what she say to them? Do not call me Naomi, which that name means pleasant. Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. That name means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me that, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So she's dealing with a devastating situation, right? This is the lowest of lows for Naomi. However, there's always hope for God's people. God never leaves his people. He's never unfaithful to his people, no matter how unfaithful his people prove to be to him. And before chapter 1 ends, we get a glimmer of this hope to come. Look at starting in verse 6. So the narrator says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So there's a glimmer of hope. So she set out from that place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Now look at verse 22, the very end of chapter 1. We read, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. So you catch this, how this chapter is bookended? It begins with famine in the land, and it ends with this mention of a harvest. And what the rest of Ruth is all about is the harvest that he is going to bring to Naomi and to her family. And so, I bring you back to the question that I asked at the beginning. Do you trust our God? In the hardest moments of your life, do you trust Him? Do you trust that He is indeed working everything together for good for those who love Him? Do you believe that? As we shall soon see, the loss and tragedy that struck this family in the land of Moab was not pointless. God was working it together for good, and guess what? Naomi and her family could not yet see what that good would be. Oftentimes in our lives, that's going to be the same. The question is, do you trust our God even in the darkest, toughest moments of your life? And so, that's the setting. That gives us the backdrop to the book as we're, and gives us something uh, of what we should expect to see in the coming weeks. Now I want to talk very, very briefly about the main characters in the book. Humanly speaking, there are three main characters in this book. Now, first and foremost, Naomi is the main character of the book, even despite the title of the book. Okay? Naomi is the main character. It is all about how Naomi is... Uh, being dealt with by God and how God redeems Naomi and her family. Ruth, from whom the book is named, is what we could call the central character to the plot. Okay? Ruth, as we know, is one of the Moabite daughters-in-law to Ruth. We know she is now a widow. And we also know that she is the one who chose to forsake her country and her country's gods and the hope of a future husband, in order to go with uh, Naomi back to Bethlehem, which is a whole lot of unknown for Ruth. 
Naomi can't produce a husband for her, so there's a whole lot of unknown. But what's Naomi decide? No, your people are going to be my people, and Naomi, your God, Yahweh, will be my God. And so Ruth takes shelter under the wings of Yahweh. And it is through Ruth that God would restore and redeem Naomi from her losses as Ruth finds favor in the third central character, Boaz. Boaz serves as the hero of the story. He is the kinsman redeemer. Boaz is a godly man. As we will see in the coming weeks, Boaz is a man of integrity. And Boaz is a godly man that God uses to preserve a remnant of his people for himself. However, there's one more character. And this character often goes overlooked, just as he does in our everyday lives. The main character, the central character to the book of Ruth, is God himself. God does not explicitly mention doing anything in the book of Ruth except one time. He is mentioned several times throughout the narrative, but his acting goes undetected. But similar to the book of Esther, what we know is that God is active and present at every turn in these characters' lives. And like I said at the beginning of the sermon, the book of Ruth is all about the faithfulness of God. Which brings us to the last thing I want us to see this morning. Two of the main themes. Now, these are not exhaustive. Obviously, kinsman redeemer is a huge theme we're going to be covering. I have two that I want us to focus on this morning. And I want us to focus on them because I want you, these can be easily overlooked if we're not looking for them. So at the beginning, I want to put them in your brain so we move through, Ruth, you'll be able to look for them. Two things, the providence of God and the faithfulness of God. These are two main themes to the book of Ruth. The providence of God and the faithfulness of God. So first, the providence of God. We can define the providence of God as the acts of God in the affairs of this world whereby He cares for His people and brings about His good, sovereign purposes. Okay? So the sovereignty of God asserts that God is sovereign. He's in control. He is governing all the affairs of this life. Every detail. You can think of providence as God actually working in the affairs and the lives of His people for their good, for His purposes. Okay? Now, here's the thing about the providence of God. Most of the time, it goes undetected. Why? Because He works through secondary means. God most often does not uh, explicitly and directly work out His purposes. He uses secondary means. Think about this. He determines the boundaries of your dwelling place, right? He determines your family. He determines that you will be here this morning. Now, you still got in the car, came here, you know, you heard from a friend, whatever. Those are all secondary means, but God used them. So, things of that nature are how the providence of God works out most often. If we think back to the book of Ruth, it's apparent that God is providentially orchestrating everything that comes to pass through secondary means. For example, there is a famine in the land, okay? There is a famine in the land. God caused that famine by withholding rain, however he did it. He caused it through secondary means. And why did he cause it? Well, to get Elimelech and his family into Moab. Why is that important? Because he needs to bring Ruth into the family, That's why that's important. And then Elimelech, Naomi's two sons, die. That's bitter providence. What's God up to there? Well, ultimately, that's going to drive her back to Bethlehem, right? Especially when she hears that God is kindly dealing with his people. Now, throughout the book, such as in chapter 2, verse 3, this is one of the reasons why I love the book of Ruth, by the way. So chapter 2, verse 3, you're going to get these all across Ruth. And it happens like this. Ruth just so happened to land in the field that belonged to Boaz. Okay, now was that happenstance? Coincidence? I think not. That is the providence of God on display. And so, God is orchestrating the circumstances of Naomi and Ruth's lives to bring about His good purposes, which are always good for His people. And so I want you to keep this in mind when it comes to God's providential care for you. You're not always going to see what God is up to in any given situation. You actually may be, if if the circumstances are difficult enough, like the psalmist, cry out, God, where are you? 
And yet, God is always working for your good, even when you can't yet detect it. As we go about our lives, we can only see one side of the tapestry that God is creating, right? And especially in the midst of bitter providence, we can hardly think of how it is God's weaving all of this together into a beautiful masterpiece. But we know that He is. We just have to trust Him. You see, there are no coincidences in this life. None. There are divine opportunities and divine providence. With what happens in most of our lives, we're never going to understand all of God's purposes in those moments. We might come to a place where we see a few of those purposes. We're probably not going to understand most of them because we think in terms of like one plus one equals two, right? God is not bound to that. God does something, and at the same time, he's doing a million things, and we won't know all of it. Think of Ruth, Naomi. They certainly saw some of what God was doing, right? Naomi, or Ruth, gets married to Boaz. They have a child. The family's redeemed. The family name's going to be carried on through him. Great. I guarantee they didn't know exactly what God was up to through the marriage of Ruth and Boaz. And so we have to trust the goodness of God even when we can't see exactly what he is up to. Do you trust our God? And then secondly, the faithfulness of God is written all over the book of Ruth. Obviously, we see the faithfulness of God to Naomi and her family, but we need to know that the faithfulness of God is much bigger than one particular family. Think of the time period once again. So we're in the time of the judges, this downward spiral of Israel into this cesspool of depravity. There was no king. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And yet, while God's people proved unfaithful to him, he was proving himself faithful to them, even in spite of them. He was, as the nation rebelled against him, through an obscure, ordinary group of people, preserving a remnant for himself. You see, he was remaining true even to his promises to the patriarchs. And at the same time, he was dealing with the fact that there was no king in Israel. You see, the book of Ruth ends with a genealogy. Now, most people, as they go to this book, they're all about the romance. So once the genealogy starts, they're out, right? Okay, the good part's over. Here's the issue. The genealogy is the most significant part of this book. It really is. Here's what we read at the end of the book. Chapter 4, starting in verse 18. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Here we go. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered who? David. Now, we don't have time to break down all of those names, Okay. There should be one that sticks out a whole lot more than the others. Ruth and Boaz's son is the grandfather of King David. Whereas Boaz was the kinsman redeemer who restored Naomi and her family, King David restored, unified the kingdom of Israel, right? And so isn't it amazing That right here, in the time of the judges, when his people are proving unfaithful to him, God is proving faithful to them, and he is paving a way for great King David, who is the royal hope of the Old Testament, to come into this world and unite the kingdom. Man, that's faithfulness, if I've ever heard of it. But the faithfulness of God in the book of Ruth, we need to know that it goes beyond Naomi and her family. It even goes beyond the nation of Israel It goes to all the peoples of the earth. You know how I know that? Because there's another genealogy that's quite important. And it comes at the beginning of Matthew. And in that genealogy, Ruth, Boaz, Ruth, Boaz, who am I thinking of? And David. (laughs) Forget the most important one. Ruth, Boaz, and David are all named in that genealogy. Whose genealogy is that? It is the great King David's greater son. That's who is in that genealogy. And so, Jesus said, all of the scriptures bear witness about me. He on the Emmaus road told his disciples, hey, listen, I'm going to interpret to you from all the Old Testament, all the things and all the scripture that points to me. And guess what? 
Ruth is no exception to that. Ruth is indeed a story of redemption, but it's not just a story of redemption for Naomi and her family. It's not just a story of redemption for the nation of Israel. Although those two are true, it is a story of redemption for the peoples of the earth in general. Peoples from every nation, language, tribe, tongue, everybody is going to receive redemption through what God is doing all the way back here in the book of Ruth. Because David's greater son was going to provide redemption. How was he going to do that? By spilling his blood for sinners like you and me. He died on the cross to take upon our shame, take upon our guilt, and he died the death that we deserve to die for our rebellion against God. And then he rose again from the dead. You know why he rose? Because it was God's stamp of approval. He succeeded where the first Adam failed, which means death could not hold him down. He won the prize that Adam could have won if he would have obeyed, but he didn't obey. And for all of those who believe in him, they get to share in his victory. We have forgiveness of sins because of the great, 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 somehow great grandson of Ruth and Boaz. So the book of Ruth is all about Jesus. It's all about God's redeeming on an individual level, on a national level, and on a whole worldwide level. And so let me ask you this. Do you trust our God? Do you trust Him? No matter what's happened in your life, no matter what is happening in your life currently, you can trust in the faithfulness and the providential care of God. He will indeed work all things together for your good. He will most certainly accomplish all of His redemptive purposes. And what we also learn from this in the book of Judges is He will do that through us and, if necessary, in